Hello, hi. Uh, welcome to my presentation. Uh, this presentation is about connecting the dots in EDS and its core morbidities. And uh, my name is Pradeep Chopra. I'm a physician. Uh, so <clears throat> we're, I'm a pain specialist. So obviously, I'm going to talk a lot about managing pain in children and adults with Ellis Danlos syndromes. Unfortunately, given the time, I can only touch on some of these basic topics, but there are some excellent speakers um, on this forum, and he'll, they'll be talking about it in much greater detail. My job is to sort of uh, put everything together. <clears throat> so this is a standard disclaimer. I have no potential conflict of interest. Uh, as a disclosure, I am a pain medicine specialist with a special interest in complex pain medicine, uh, trained at the Harvard Medical School. Uh, I now teach at the Brown Medical School in the US. And uh, I'm on a bunch of uh, nonprofit organizations. I have no financial disclosure with this presentation. Um, so let's talk about managing pain in any condition. Uh, th there's only one rule and no other rule. The only real rule in managing pain is to find out what's causing this pain, what's broken, fixing it, and then moving on. And sometimes you can't fix it, but at least you can do your best at fixing it. So. Same thing with Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. We've got to find out what's broken over here, what's causing this pain, and then fixing it. So for example, if someone has pain from a dislocated shoulder joint, uh, if they have pain in a shoulder joint, it could be a dislocated shoulder joint. It could be subluxations. It could be muscle spasms around the shoulder joint, or it could even be a pinched nerve at the shoulder joint, or it could be any or all of the above. So. My job, or as, or as physicians, our job is to find out, okay, which one, what's, which, what is the problem here and fixing it. There's no, there's no magical Band-Aid that'll fix all pain conditions in general. It's like fixing the problem itself. Once you find out what's broken and once you find out what the problem is, now comes the issue of how do you treat it? And again, there's no, because of these complex conditions, there's no one single method or single treatment. You have to use a mix of treatments. And so if you use 10% on one, say physical therapy, 10%, medicines, 10%, braces, 10%, maybe surgery, 10%. So if you use five, five things, each of them giving you 10% relief, um, you get 50% relief. And that's the whole idea. For example, if someone has pain due to knee instability, then you know you can put a brace that'll give you 10% relief. Stand in the muscles gives you another 10%. Using medicines, another 10% and so forth, you get 50% pain relief. So don't expect that physicians treating this, your pain will have one, one particular treatment and that'll take care of everything. I call this the NC 10% rule, which is 10% from each. So your expectation from any treatment should be 10%. If you get 10%, great. Don't stop a medicine because you're not getting, say, 50% or 100% relief. So it's difficult to discuss EDS without going through three, each system. And I had to sort of break it down uh, by each body part. So I'm starting from the top, I'm going to talk a little bit about headaches. Uh, there are lots and lots of reasons for having headaches. I've picked and chosen a few of the more important ones uh, that you, we see specifically in EDS, but you know things like migraines are also common in EDS, which uh, in, for, for saving time, I won't get into those common ones. So um, this particular symptom is my, my whole head hurts and, I, and my vision is double and I can hear a whooshing sound in my ear. Um, it's, a, it's like my heartbeat, I can hear it in my ears. This is a symptom of something called uh, intracranial hypertension. That means the pressure inside the head is high. And there are many reasons for having that. And that's, that's uh, as physicians, that's my job. That's our job to figure that out. Um, so patients with um, high pressure inside their head will obviously present with uh, severe pain uh, around the entire head. They'll present with vision issues, sometimes double vision, and like I said, they'll have this pulsatile tinnitus. They describe it more like a whooshing sound in, in, in sync with their heartbeats. <clears throat> the, 
there's another headache that gets worse with standing but goes away with lying down remember it goes away completely with lying down um, and as soon as you stand it comes back so this is where the you can see the brain and the spinal cord here and this csf fluid that flows across this so the C fluid that is the entire brain and the spinal cord is in a closed compartment with the fluid and everything floats in it and if there's a leak in any place in any spot then the pressure inside drops and once the pressure drops, these patients present with headaches and these headaches get worse with standing and go away with lying down. So, um, so these headaches get worse when you stand and they resolve completely with lying down. Uh, and, and that's usually because of low pressure in the head. But there is one situation where you can actually have a high pressure inside the head. And because there's a high pressure inside the head, it creates a leak so that the pressure can be normalized. So these patients can present with high pressure, um, high pressure headaches, but can also have a CSF leak also. So it's a, it's a tricky situation to figure this out. My headaches get worse when I cough, and I also get this tingling sensation in my hands and feet. I get difficulty swallowing or choking uh, sensation. This actually is a form of uh, what's called Chiari malformation. Chiari malformation is um, briefly describing it's your brain trying to herniate through the hole at the bottom of your skull. So there's a hole at the bottom of the skull and it's the brain trying to push through. So patients with Chiari malformation present with neck pain. They have balance issues. Um, they present with dizziness. And look at this, dizziness can also be from POTS. So they have dizziness also, they have difficulty swallowing, poor hand coordination. And again, the headache gets worse with coughing. The reason is that in carry malformation, the pressure inside the head increases. So they present with the same symptoms as raised intracranial hypertension. <clears throat> this is a common, very common situation where patients complain that, that my head feels too heavy for my, my neck. And so the head starts to feel heavier and heavier as the day progresses. It usually happens towards the end of the day. And this is a symptom of something called craniocervical instability. They have neck pain, they have headaches, uh, they have difficulty swallowing, and they have symptoms of actually POTS. So they have fatigue and dizziness also. And oftentimes there are symptoms, you'll find them sitting with their, um, their hand, their chin resting on their hand, or they'll find them sitting with their head like this. Um, and this is a symptom of craniocervical instability where the spine in the neck is unstable. So remember, a lot of these symptoms overlap with other conditions, a lot of them. So some dizziness can happen from carry malformation or CCI, but it can also happen from POTS. It can also happen from mast cell activation syndrome. So it's a bit of a bit of a dilemma at figuring out which is what is causing what. One of the important things I need you to really understand is micro trauma. So anytime I get up and I walk from my house down to the down a block, I wear I, there is some wear and tear of my body. So there's tissue wearing out, my body is repairing it right away. It happens in patients with EDS also. The difference being that in EDS it takes there's much more wear and tear. And because the, because because their their tissue is softer, it also takes much longer to heal, which is why when they do activities that involve repetitive movements like vacuuming, chopping food, or doing a dusting, they tend to start having more and more pain. It also, the reason I put this slide here is also to let you know that exercising too hard, even exercising to your limit is also not a good idea. One of the principles of exercising in EDS is to exercise under your limit. And this is the reason because you don't want to cause too much micro trauma. This is a picture I wanted to show you. On the left, you can see a normal muscle. And on the right, you can see a, a same thing in an EDS where the mus there's, there's, there's been enough, there's been plenty of micro trauma and the muscle is completely damaged. At the bottom, you can see this, um, a picture of a of a tendon and you can see the ligament the tendon over there and part of it is damaged 
this is the what you see in EDS where this there is a microscopic damage to the tissue and the tendons. So uh, one of the major problems that we've always had, which I see a lot, is rib subluxations. The pain from rib subluxations is excruciating. It's a horrible, horrible pain. And I wanted to show you why people have this. So this is, an, as you can see, this is normal anatomy and you can see the ribs. They, they articulate with the thoracic spine at the back. So you can see the ribs make a joint with, this, with the thoracic spine in the back. Now, what happens is like everywhere else, if you bend the spine, the, rib, the joints become loose and the ribs come out of their out of their place. So flexing the spine or going to the left side or going to the right side will cause these ribs over here to pop out from their joints. And that's the rib subluxation you see. So in this pictorial, I wanted to show you. So when there's lateral movement, a movement to the left or to the right, in this case, movement to the left will cause the ribs on the right side to pop out and they sublux. Um, another common problem uh, we see fairly a lot is tethered cord syndrome. Um, I'm hoping there will be a speaker on that subject uh, in this conference. So these patients present with back pain and there's no other reason to explain the back pain. They have bladder issues, they have weakness in their legs. Their legs get weaker and weaker as they walk. And sometimes they even have cramping in their calf muscles. Um, so oftentimes patients with tethered cord syndrome will have these symptoms. <clears throat> So I want to show you what tethered cord syndrome is. On the left, you see a normal spine and you can see it ends at L1 and then you can see below that L1, it becomes a phylum. It's just a thread hanging loosely in there. And the reason it hangs loosely is because as we grow taller or as you move, it moves with you. Whereas on the right side, you see a tethered cord syndrome where the, the phylum is now tethered to the bottom of the spine. So that means it's now pulling on the spinal cord and that's where these symptoms come from. Uh, the point I'm trying to make out is that MRI is not a useful tool for diagnosis of tethered cord syndrome. So you are going to get a lot of uh, pushback from physicians who might say, well, it didn't show up on an MRI. It actually does not show up on an MRI. It's very rarely that you see it on an MRI. The diagnosis is basically made on somebody who understands tethered cord very well. It's, a, it's examining the patient. And also they do be, need to do a urodynamic study, which is studying the bladder that also gives some information to them. Delhi pain, this is a huge issue. I think uh, I have to say that almost 80% of my patients have abdominal pain. It's very common, and I'll list a few of them over here, gastroparesis, where they're slowing down of the stomach. So imagine your intestine is like a long tube and food moves along as a toothpaste. And so they're slowing down, so the food sits there, it begins to ferment, they get gassy, they get bloated, and then they get pain. Pots can cause uh, abdominal pain. Uh, because the uh, intestines slow down, they, they have a condition called SIBO or small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. Um, in some cases, especially patients who've had abdominal surgery may develop what is called acnes or anterior cutaneous nerve entrapment syndrome. What that really means is that the nerve in the abdomen gets trapped and in the muscle and it causes excruciating pain. The worst pain of all in, uh, in, in GI issues is median arcuate ligament syndrome, also known as MELS. These patients present with severe, severe excruciating pain every time they eat. Mast cell activation syndrome, and I'll talk a little bit more about it, can cause diffuse inflammation in the intestines. And so once the intestine gets inflamed, it goes quiet, it stops working, it stops moving. So they start to present with not only GI pain, but, uh, but also bloating, nausea, and diarrhea. So <clears throat> some of that, I basically, um, I mentioned a few diets over here. Um, I mean, obviously talking about treatments is a, is a completely different talk. Uh, a gluten-free diet usually works well. Dairy-free diet usually works very well. Um, but what really has worked out well in these patients is a low FODMAP diet. It's a really complicated uh, process to explain a low FODMAP diet. Um, if you Google it, there's plenty of information out there. So going back to 
um, the human body, pain in the arms. You can have lots of reasons. The joints can sublux. Uh, there can be tendonitis. There's hyperextension of the elbows that can cause uh, nerve stretching. There's thoracic outlet syndrome where the nerve is pinched. So there's plenty of reasons for having pain in the arms. This is what a pain from thoracic outlet syndrome looks like. Um, the, in this case, the nerve is pinched at the, at, in, at the, under the collarbone and they have these pres this presentation. Uh, patients tend to have poor proprioception or joint position sense. So they tend to hold things really tight. And as a result, um, their small muscles in their hands starts to start to hurt. They're, because they're, their fingers are lax, they try to use even more force. And so they tend to have pain in their dominant hand. Some of the things you can use is a fingerless compression glove or um, ring splints. Ring splints can then stabilize these joints, these hyper um, lax joints. So that brings me to this question about splinting and braces. The splinting and braces don't reach, the job of a brace is to keep your joint in a very neutral position. It, it's, you avoid hyperextension. Um, one of the questions, one of the problems we have is doctors will say, uh, well, don't wear a brace because it makes your muscles weak. And that is absolutely not true. Uh, braces do not surround muscles, they surround joints. They don't do anything to the muscles, but when they align the joints, then your muscles can move more efficiently. If I have instability of my left knee and I don't wear a brace, I won't move, I'll just sit in a chair. I put on a brace, now my knee feels better, I feel more stable, I walk more, therefore I use my muscles more. And that is why braces do not make your muscles weaker, actually they make them stronger. Lower body pain, I wanna to talk to you about this. Um, start with lower body pain, you start from the feet and ankles. If your feet and ankles are unstable, that makes your knees unstable, which makes your hips unstable, which throws your spine off. And so to, to treat somebody with lower body pain, you, I usually will start at the feet and ankles. So let's start with this. Uh, over here, you can see very clearly this person has flat feet. Uh, and flat feet, which means loss of arch or the collapsing arch is very common in EDS. It takes away that spring in your walk. That's the problem. <clears throat> when they also have flat feet, their ankles pronate. So you can see how the ankles have turned to the side. And what as a result, when they stand, they are not pulling, they're putting their weight in a, they're putting their weight incorrectly. It's not going down their ankles. Um, so that's where that makes ankle even more unstable. So the best way I think is to fix unstable ankles is to wear proper shoes. And the shoes that I like are high top shoes. Uh, make sure that they are wide because your toes open out. Make sure they have laces and make sure they have a good arch support. Um, these are what high top shoes look like. So that on the left, you can see those are bas um, basketball, volleyball shoes. On the left, on the right, you can see straightforward hiking boots. So these these are um, these support these, these give your ankles a lot of support. Um, <clears throat> they should have laces. Make sure that they should have laces. Moving up to the knees, um, over here you can see how the knee is uh, is hyperextended, so it's going backwards. That means the weight of the body is being by, is bypassing the knee and going straight to the ankle. And that's how it starts to cause even more and more pain. Um, with a hyperextended knee, the best treatment is to try a knee brace. The knee brace should have a strap on the top and a strap at the bottom. It should have a, uh, it has two struts or hinges on the side that keep your knee from hyperextending. So if this is your normal knee, this is your unstable knee. So it, the brace keeps it in position. There's a donut in the front that keeps the patella from moving away. A um, little bit about POTS. I know there's somebody who will be talking about POTS and dysautonomia in detail. Uh, patients with POTS present with fainting, dizziness. Now, I talked to you about headaches and neck issues and all. You get fainting and dizziness there also. Palpitations. Um, these, these usually happen when they stand, so they get kind of dizzy or lightheaded when they stand, their heart starts to beat faster. But the, the biggest problem is that they have fatigue. And one of the problems with in POTS is that 
it's a question of getting enough oxygen to the tissue. And I find that these patients, once you fix that problem, their fatigue starts to get better. They do have headaches, but it's not a big deal. The headaches come on only when they stand and they go away when they lie down. They get brain fog. And this brain fog is usually because of poor oxygen flow to their uh, brains. And so they get this brain fog. It also, because their heart is racing so fast, it makes their, it gives them a sense of anxiety. It gives them a sense of flight and fight. And that's why most patients get misdiagnosed as, ha as having anxiety, but this is not really anxiety. It's a manifestation of POTS or dysautonomia. So moving on to my next one is uh, mast cell activation syndrome. This is a pretty bad condition, and I'm, I'm hoping that there will be a speaker on this subject. In mast cell activation syndrome, the best way to explain it is that it feels like you have flu all the time. You feel like you're tired, you're cold, you're warm, you're hot, you're sweaty, um, you have, you're sick, you have no appetite. It's like, it feels like you're coming down with flu. It's a very painful condition. It causes pain everywhere. Um, not only does it cause pain everywhere, but it also causes pain in joints that are already painful. It causes rashes, itching, stomach pain, bladder pain, bone pain. So these are some of the issues with mast cell activation syndrome. Fatigue is a really uh, big deal in EDS, especially in children. Uh, there's plenty of reasons to have fatigue, which includes EDS. POTS can cause fatigue. It's a big reason. Mast cell activation syndrome causes a lot of fatigue. Medicines to treat these conditions can cause fatigue. Pain causes fatigue. They all have poor sleep. That's what we call as uh, sleep inversion. So they're up all night and they're asleep all day. Um, and a lot of them, I suspect, have a secondary mitochondrial dysfunction, which is the mitochondria are like rechargeable batteries in your in your body. And once these rechar these rechargeable batteries don't work well, and so they have what is called a secondary mitochondrial dysfunction. And, and there are ways to treat that. So um, to sum up my entire presentation, I wanted to show you how different things are connected. And there's not, remember I told you in the beginning that to find out what's, what the problem is, you have to look at what's broken. So for example, looking at fatigue, you know, EDS can cause fatigue and EDS can ca cause POTS and EDS can cause mast cell. So all three of these conditions cause fatigue. And so simply treating POTS is not going to take care of the fatigue. You've got to treat the mast cell also. And that's where the problem is. Uh, diffuse pain. All of these three conditions can cause uh, pain. I'm not even including the spinal conditions like CC, uh, craniocervical instability or tethered cord syndrome. All of these can combined cause pain. And so you've got to find out what's causing that problem and then treating it. Headaches can happen from tethered cord. They can happen from carry malformation. They can happen from CSF leak. They can happen from uh, high pressure in the head. They can happen from POTS, mast cell, EDS. So there are a hundred reasons why patients with EDS can have headaches. So finding out and pinpointing like, okay, um, these are the two or three different culprits that are causing headaches. Let's just treat them one by one and see what happens. Joint pain, you can see joint pain and actually you can see it in mast cell. You can see it in tethered cord syndromes also. Dizziness can happen in POTS. It can happen in carry malformation. It can happen in um, craniocervical instability. So as you can see, uh, as you can see what I'm trying to explain is that there's no one single explanation to a lot of these symptoms. Uh, uh, there's a combination of these symptoms. So one has to treat each one of these at a time. GI issues can cause all of these. They can cause POTS, mast cell, pain, uh, nutrition is gone, uh, goes down the tube. So all of these can cause uh, <clears throat> GI issues. That feeling of anxiety, which are often misdiagnosed as, oh, you're anxious, is can be caused from POTS or mast cell activation syndrome. Actually, mast cell activation syndrome can also make your POTS worse. So uh, with this, I'd like to thank you for my presentation. I know it's a very brief presentation and I know I went at rocket speed, but I wanted to put it in all there. I haven't talked about treatments because that is a whole five day talk, uh, but I hope you understand uh, the issues that come with ADS. Thank you so much.